I'm really excited to be here and thank you for organizing this workshop to some extent. Uh, I think over the years, uh, interactive systems is something that uh, I've been working on again and again. Uh, so it's really great to see a, a, a workshop in that space finally. Um, so I was really conflicted about uh, what to talk about here. And I also had, I was, it was in kind of like a near miss of getting this uh, talk done. Uh, a few days ago, I was just about uh, to email the uh, organizers and cancel the talk as, as, as I broke my wrist. Uh, and, the and most of the slides, uh, not surprisingly, weren't ready. Luckily for me, that my students jumped in and uh, Nori and Elaine did uh, much of the work to make uh, this uh, happen. And I was saying there's a, there's a lot of work following, you know, following Dorsa's talk on robotics. I'm a bit, uh, I'm a bit conflicted and sorry, I didn't, I, I'm not talking about our robot and, and uh, language work, but uh, I am a, I'm almost a person of like limited attention span and always more excited about talking about the most recent stuff. So I want to talk today about uh, our uh, recent work on continual learning through collaborative interaction with users, and specifically we focus on on a, on a generation. Uh, I know this uh, setups is even after a year and a half in this hell. Uh, this is a pretty uh, awkward. I usually find it the most helpful for everyone if it's more interactive. So feel free to barge in. I'll do my best to. Uh, monitor the chat and I'm more than happy to, uh, I'm actually would love to take questions uh, throughout. Okay, so the talk will be divided into uh, three major parts. In the first part, I'll kind of like in a very abstract way, describe the types of uh, scenarios uh, I'm interested in and uh, the, uh, that are the focus uh, today. Uh, in the second part, uh, I'll uh, describe serial bar, which is a, an instantiation of, of this scenario in, a in an instructional game. And finally, for the bulk of the talk today, I'll focus on uh, some very recent work on instruction generation learning, specifically with focus on continual learning in this kind of collaborative scenarios. Okay, so the kind of scenario that we're interested in have at least two agents, a, a human user and a system, and uh, these are collaborative scenarios. So something that is really important we are going to emphasize is that both of these agents act and change the world. Uh, and they coordinate using natural language. So just to kind of like to make it a bit more grounded, you can think of the system as a robot in a physical environment uh, or you know, working together alongside a human or a virtual agent in a structured software environment. So, you know, maybe you are kind of like building this uh, crazy spreadsheet together with the, with the virtual assistant, and you're kind of like delegating, delegating each other tasks and coordinating using natural language. So as, as you can already understand from this, as far as the language problem, this kind of scenario offers a very broad perspective of, of, a, of language. Uh, we have problems of language understanding, so, for example, uh, if you give instructions to the system, you would like to follow them. Uh, there are problems of generation. The systems can potentially ask for questions or clarifications, or it can give you instructions by delegating tasks to you uh, because you're also operating in the world. So depending on the setup, we are, we are kind of like looking at the full-fledged dialogue problem. Another very important aspect of, a, of this kind of scenarios that arises from the collaboration is dynamic delegation. Uh, so users can kind of like dynamically uh, delegate tasks and they can adapt and, and see how the system is responding and decide to do certain things on their own and certain things that are better delegated to the system. You know, so you can ask the system to do something, see that it's, it's, it's maybe not, not really understanding you uh, or maybe it's having a hard time doing that. So you say, okay, because I can act in the world, not everything is lost, I'll just do it myself and I'll delegate other tasks to the system. And this is really going to be something very important when you talk about uh, problems like uh, continual learning and, uh, and adaptation. So as far as learning, um, this kind of scenarios where the user is sitting there in the system and working with it together uh, are great facilitators for, uh, for uh, learning on the fly from interactions. And there are uh, numerous types of learning signals that you can encounter. Some of the, some of the uh, you know, clearest ones uh, are explicit feedback, for example. Uh, you can give the system uh, an instruction, and then as you uh, 
observe it, uh, executing it, you can give it like, you know, even the simplest kind of like binary signal, positive and negative signal, if it's doing good or bad. Another type of signal that, op that exists in this kind of system is observational signal. So, for example, if the system uh, tells you to do something and then observes you and sees that you're doing something completely different, it can infer that maybe it didn't uh, express its intents correctly and it should maybe adjust how it's generated the instruction. And of course, there are many other signals in this kind of rich interaction. So Serial Bar is a, is a collaborative game that uh, instantiates uh, this kind of interaction scenario uh, with a sequential uh, natural language instruction. So in Serial Bar, there are two agents that collaborate in an environment. They both act in the world, so they have this like very important part of collaboration. And there is a unidirectional natural language instruction channel. So one of the agents is a follower and another is a leader. And we, the natural language only goes from the leader to the follower in the form of instruction. So, there is this, so this scenario is relatively expressive. It's, it allows us to study a very interesting lear a, a learning algorithm, but it's also scoped because it doesn't require addressing the full dialogue system. And this, in a way, in a, in a way allows us to focus on a maybe more complex or weaker learning signals. OK, so this is the serial bar uh, environment. Uh, each of these, uh, it, this, kind, this kind of environment is generated randomly for every game. So every game has a new environment. This environment includes passable terrains, uh, impassable terrains, different uh, types of landmarks, and a lot of cards that are spread around this environment and have like different colors and patterns and numbers on them. In this environment, we have two agents. We have a, a leader. This is this colorful figure on the left. And we have a follower, the monochromatic uh, figure here on the, sorry, on the right and on the left. Uh, and the two agents together, they play a game that, if you're familiar with, is very similar to the card game set, but takes place in a spatial environment. So they go around the environment and they collect valid sets of three cards, where a valid set has a unique color, shape, and count. And each time they complete a set, they get a point. So just uh, for an example, uh, this is a, an example of a, of a valid set of cards, because each of the color, shape, and count are unique. Whereas this set is invalid because the count three appears twice. Okay, so the two uh, agents they move around the environment and they take turns, and in each turn they have limited number of steps. So they move around the board, they select uh, cards, and when a valid uh, set, set of cards is selected, the cards disappear and new ones randomly appear in the environment and the agents get more turns when completing the set. So the better you do, the more turns you will get and the you will have a chance to even score higher and higher in the game. So there is like this uh, kind of like, you know, the richer get rich kind of uh, scheme happening here. Uh, so let's look at a very kind of like exa a short example to dynamic. So here, for example, uh, this is our leader and here is our follower. And the leader will start by in their turn taking this yellow plus the follower turns around, grabs this like three red bars, and then the leader in their turn will complete the set using these two pink stars and the cards disappear. Okay, the agents, they select the cards together. So the set is something they, they create together and the leader uh, instructs the follower using natural language. And the goal of the follower uh, is to just follow instructions, to do what the leader says. They can execute multiple instructions per turn or one instruction across uh, multiple turns. And we do several things to incentivize and kind of like bake collaboration into this setup. So first of all, there is an observability gap between the two agents. The leader sees the complete board while the follower only uh, sees what is, a, what is ahead of them. So they really have to follow what the leader tells them to, the leader tells them to do. Otherwise, they are uh, doing something suboptimal and they are risking sabotaging the sets the leader is planning. On the other hand, uh, the leader shouldn't really go alone because the follower has many more steps per turn. So they are like the workhorse of the game. And uh, they, so usually they lead, if the leader wants to kind of like really collect as many sets as possible, they really need to use the follower efficiently. Okay, so let's go back to our example and see how it looks from a different perspective. 
So at the top uh, is the leader perspective. So you see the, the overhead view of the board. They give an instruction, grab the free right stripes behind you. And here at the bottom is the first person view of the follower. They, they have occlusions. They don't see what is behind them. They just see what's in front of them. In this case, they don't even see uh, the, the free red bars that the leader asks them to collect. So the, the, game start, the, the game starts with the follower turn, leader turn where they collect the yellow plus. The, then the follower turns around following the instruction and collects the free red stripes. And then the leader completes the set and the cards disappear. So the serial bar scenario emphasizes uh, four uh, important aspects in, in its design. First of all, it's a spatial reasoning. So the interaction happens in a dynamic uh, 3D uh, environment that keeps changing as cards keep uh, disappear and appear. It's a collaborative interaction and working together is really critical uh, for success here. The way the, num the initial number of turns and the number of steps are, is, is, a, adjust, is a set uh, means that if they, lead, if they don't collaborate, they're just not really going to get very far. It has sequential instruction following. So, and this includes dependencies between instructions, planning ahead, a changing goal between instructions, and instructions that include multiple sub goals. For example, picking up, uh, selecting, or deselecting multiple cards. And finally, the interaction is really an important component here. Both agents are in the interaction. So it's not just you give instructions and you go make yourself coffee. You're sitting there constantly, which gives you a, this opportunity for both of them to continuously adapt and modify their strategy and become better at it. OK, so let's look at a slightly more interesting, uh, interesting example. Uh, so this is from a, a data, data set we collected where human-human games. You can think about as creating a Wizard of Oz scenario. And uh, this is a pretty good interaction. We have the leader here and the follower here. The leader starts by giving the instruction, turn left twice and head straight towards the doghouse and look for two green circles to pick up. So basically, we want to, it wants the follower to pick up this. The follower is facing in this direction. And this is, a, this is what they see. This is a first person view here at the bottom uh, left. So if this, uh, if this, uh, as I'll play this video, it starts with the follower kind of like turning a bit too much going in the other direction, but they're going to correct themselves. In the meantime, the leader goes and collects uh, this card, so they're starting building a set. The follower go collects the card. The leader gets their turn. The leader tries to get in their turn to collect the first card and to complete the set, but they don't have enough steps for it. So what's going to happen now is the follower is going to get their turn, but the leader doesn't want to, to waste the follower turn just just having them wait for them to collect this card. So what they're going to do is they're going to play ahead, plan ahead, and they're going to ask the follower to uh, turn left and head towards this uh, yellow hearts uh, card here, but don't pick it up uh, for now, and because you have to get the, the the leader has to get the card first, because otherwise it will sabotage the current set. So the uh, whoops, sorry, okay, we'll have to go through that again. Uh, and we were here. So the leader, so the follower will go, will position themselves, but not collect this card. The leader will complete the set, and then in the, in the position for, for the next card, and then they give next, the next instruction. The next instruction, they're really taking it. They say, okay, now pick up the card I told you because we are in the next set. And I'm going to use the fact that you have so many steps, and I'm going to send you to the other side of the board to collect cards. So go past uh, these uh, sticky bushes on the on, on the left end and get uh, the free green stars and, 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 and where there is a free green star. I'm not telling you to explicitly collect them, but there is some kind of like implied expectations here. So the follower the follower does that. Uh, they go they go they position the step next to the card and then the leader tells them okay after you get it so now I'm implying that you should you should get it although I'm not telling you that exactly after you get it pick up some other card and let's go and we're going to continue and do another set so you see this a lot of planning multiple sets kind of like crossing between instructions and a lot of like very uh, interesting dynamics happening between the players as they are optimizing to use their turns in the best way to increase their score. Now, there are many possible tasks that you can study within a serial bar, but the two core ones uh, is, a, is a language understanding, so instruction following, so mapping leader instructions, uh, the history of the interaction, and the first person observation of the follower to follow actions. And the other one is generating leader instructions, so 
given the, uh, the world state as the leader sees it and the history of the interaction, generate, generate an instruction for, a, for, the, for the follower to, fo uh, to follow. Uh, in, when we introduced serial bar uh, in, 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 in existing in, in a previous paper, we uh, uh, proposed an approach to solve uh, the first uh, task using uh, this wizard of Oz uh, supervised data that we collected, the human human games. And what I'm going to talk about at the rest of the talk today is uh, an approach to uh, for generation learning. So solving the, so addressing the second task of uh, generating instructions. And we're going to do it with a focus on continual learning. OK, so what does it mean to generate instruction in serial bar? So the input that you are getting is kind of like the world state from the view of the leader. And the output is an instruction describing how the follower should move in the world and select cards. So for example, here, this is our follower. And the leader wanted to go around past the lake and pick up this like blue circles here. So turn right, go straight past the lake, and collect the free blue circle card. So there is a clear intent communication, which really distinguishes the goals of this system from, uh, and from chit chat systems or systems that are optimizing for uh, maximizing uh, user engagement over time. It's really about task completion. And the first thing we need to do is we need to decide about what the cards the follow to select and what path we want them to take. So for that, we are solving it with a, with a very simple deterministic planner that kind of like finds that, that optimizes the according to the position of the two agents to which set to select and which card each of the uh, agents should, should select. So this is a deterministic planner, and it gives us a sequence of uh, follower poses. So poses the follower should take uh, as it moves uh, along a trajectory to pick specific cards. So this leaves us the, 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 you know, the crux of the problem that we're interested in. This is the language generation problem. So the problem is that given a, a world state, which I'm going to denote kind of like with this globe here, uh, and a plan, that's, which you're gonna, I'm going to use this map icon for it, we want to generate an instruction that the leader gives to uh, the follower. This instruction must use a landmarks because the follower has partial observability. It must be from the follower perspective, not from what the leader sees. Uh, and it must ex exactly specify what cards to select or deselect. So this, you can think about this like uh, the, the goals, the sub goals of an instruction. And there can, there can be zero if an instruction doesn't require any card collection, or there can be multiple of them. OK, and the main question that underlies this, the, the study that I'm describing today is if we can, can we learn to generate instructions by observing human users executing them. So let's see what it means. So assuming that we have a language proficient and a collaborative instruction follower, a good instruction relays the system intent well. And this will allow the follower to execute it as intended. Right? A bad instruction is either inscrutable, so you don't get anything out of it, or results in an unintended behavior. So the response is not, does not align with the original system intent. For us, the system intent is this plan that the planner gives us. So if we compare what the follower did to the original intent, this can give us an indication of the effectiveness of our generation, of our communication channel. OK? And there is, a, there is a very nice connection here to cognitive science and psychology studies that indicate that this kind of signal influences human language learning to various degrees. For example, uh, for morphology learning, it's actually, in some languages at least, it's known to be uh, relatively in ineffective and not, uh, not of much contribution. However, for uh, adaptation and, and, and lexical choice, uh, it seems to be uh, more influential. And uh, Krauss et al, uh, as early as 1966, showed that this kind of, a, a very similar signal that they call confirmation feedback influences conversion formation in a very primitive uh, form of a reference gain. And later on, this was reaffirmed in more contemporary styles of reference gains in several studies uh, from, uh, from between 1966 and more recently in uh, 2020 by Hawkins et al. 
So loosely speaking, this kind of connection to uh, coxine psychology uh, indicates that uh, there is a potential in this learning signal, but also, and this is maybe even uh, at least as important, that, the, the, that humans have the expectation that this kind of signal manifests in, in, a, in, interac in interactions. So they, they expect to it, they, they are, they, it's, not, it's, it's natural to them. So it will be kind of like, you know, a good opportunity for us to, uh, as, as, a, as a machine learning researcher, to use it. There is an important caveat here, and I think kind of like, if we're to put it on everything that draws connections to cognitive psychology, this is a very weak relation to human reasoning and, and learning, and it starts and ends here. Everything that, everything that I'm going to show from now on, I, I don't really, uh, we don't really have a good understanding of how it relates uh, to human reasoning. It's a very interesting direction to, to study, but this is not something we have done. Now, in generation learning, this kind of signal, at least to the best of our understanding, is extremely understudied. Uh, we are not familiar with any uh, study that, that shows effective use of it, especially uh, like with experiments in the wild. And it's different from some of the uh, kind of like common signals, uh, or, or even less common, that we see used for generation learning. The system doesn't solicit a written instruction, so it, I think it's not similar to uh, how we annotate instructions or language generation in general. And it's not similar to what we do with active learning, where we uh, choose examples to label and go to oracles and ask them to, in this case, write the instruction. We are just observing executions, and the whole instruction writing is happening generated by the system. The signal, the signal is also distinct from uh, explicit feedback, um, which meaning that the, that the user tells you if your output is good or bad, because this requires and knowing the system intent. Uh, in, our, in, in our case, or for example, in machine translation, to have some idea of the translation, in summarization, that it, where it's also been used, uh, it's for, it requires some idea of like what would be a good summarization and some, uh, some, also some idea about what document you're starting for. So the important thing here, this is a really a natural byproduct of the interaction. And this is the key to really facilitating continual learning through the interaction with users with a very limited or, or even no uh, overhead. Okay, so let's, uh, so before I describe the, the kind of like building blocks and, and the learning algorithm, I wanna, I wanna put everything in, in, in perspective. So I'm, I'm so show you an, an overview of the entire system. The, the details here don't matter because we're gonna go back to the slide after we know what goes in each of these boxes. So we start by uh, initializing our system with a minimal amount of supervised data just to get it to kickstart the learning. And we also initialize uh, our, our decoder, the, 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 the generation uh, model, with a GPT-2 weight so to give it some kind of an idea of a, of a language, of, you know, gen from, of general language model uh, knowledge. And then we have a generation model and we start deploying it and we are doing it in rounds. Uh, in each round, uh, we are interacting with users. And during this interaction, we are going to sample instructions given the current state of the interaction and everything from our generation model. From these interactions, we are going to observe what the users are doing and we're going to construct the training data, which we aggregate over time. So the data set grow, constantly grows as we interact more with the users. And then at, at the end of each of, the, and we, at the end of this, each of these rounds, we do offline contextual bandit training to create a new generation model, which we deploy for the next round, okay? Okay, so how does this work in serial bar? So the human users are our followers and the system is the leader. Users only see the natural language. They, they don't see what the system intends for them to do. There is no any sort of visualization of that. And the collaborative goals that, that, that are baked into serial bar, they are what uh, is responsible for aligning the human follower incentive with successful intent communication. So the humans are really incentivized to understand what the system tells them and, and kind of like, and help and, and, and work together with the system. So we have this very collaborative language proficient, proficient follower. The language channel is unidirectional, which is, which is a slight limitation uh, for us because uh, we would like to, want to have some kind of feedback for like at least blatant errors. So if the user wants to tell us this doesn't make any sense or I have no idea what you said. So what we do is we add uh, feedback questions, like two binary feedback questions about perceived correctness and grammaticality 
after each instruction to catch these really bad cases. Although later on we experiment without this feedback question as well, and you can see kind of like uh, how the influence, it's, it's a bit more nuanced than, than we initially expected even. Okay, so how does it look from the user perspective? So let's, so I'm gonna take you through two examples here. Um, basically two instructions that, the, fo that the, the follower is getting from the system and the, the whole process that they are going, how the interaction looks on their side. So this is their, this is the perspective, this is the entire interface actually. They, you see that they see the environment. Currently it's the leader turn, so everything is disabled here. And the leader gave them a new instruction, turn right and go straight past the lake and collect the free blue circle card. This is actually instruction generated by our system following uh, the learning. So the, the leader gives them this instruction and then they are getting their turn. You see everything became green, so now they can, op they can move in the environment. And they start executing it. So they go, they go straight. They go, they pass this lake that they're seeing here, and they, and then they see this like free blue circle card. They go and collect it. Uh, in the meantime, they ran out of steps. So it's the, it's the leader turn now, and it will go back to them. Uh, control will come back to the follower in a second. They collect the card, and they indicate that they finished uh, the, the instruction and they want to get the next one. And then they get a question: Did you follow all parts of the leader's command and find everything correct? So this is a perceived correctness version. What we are showing them is what they did, not what not the original intent. So it's just a visualization to remind them what, what they have done. And we ask them, do you think this is correct given what you were instructed to do? So in this case, they're gonna say yes. And then we ask them grammaticality. Is it grammatical and well-written? This is grammatical, so great. So then, then the leader gets their turn and they give them another instruction. Uh, in this case, the new instruction is turn left grab the black star, and then the two green squares, then the, then the green square. You can already see that something here doesn't make sense, especially if you're really proficient in the, in, the, uh, in, the set, in, the, in the rules of set. So they're going to try to execute. They're going to turn left, uh, and they're going to look for this uh, here. You can see that they're seeing this like black star. They're going to grab that. Once they're there, they, can all, they also see the green square. So they're going to also run to that and grab that. And then they will, uh, they will finish the command uh, to get the next one. Uh, and what they are, they're asked is this, do you perceive it as correct? They're gonna say no, because they didn't really complete everything, but it is grammatical. Okay, and the, the interaction continues, they get another instruction. This continues until they actually run out of turns. And it can be pretty long, because especially as the system gets better and, and, and gives better instructions to the follower. Okay, if there are any questions so far, I'm please, I'm happy to answer either in the chat or just unmute yourself and jump in. <clears throat> okay, so this kind of interaction gives us, a, you know, gives us data that looks like this. For every example, we get, a, we get the world state, the world start state that when the instruction was given. We get the system plan, a, what, what was the underlying intent that wasn't visible to the user. We get a generated instruction. This is the instruction that we sampled from whatever was the model at that time. We can record the user execution, and we also have the responses to the perceived correctness and grammaticality binary question. Now, something that is important here is that the system plan and the user execution, they're actually, they actually follow the exact same representation. They are both sequences of observed poses, and this is going to be useful because we are going to kind of like treat them interchangeably and compare them while we are uh, using, while we are processing this data. Okay, so using this data, we uh, we compute a, a reward. The uh, the reward is to, to do this, we compare the system plan to the user's uh, execution, and if they diverge, we know that the instruction is not a good representation of the plan because otherwise the user, it, they, they wouldn't have diverged or the version would have been very small. So the system intent was not relayed well by the instruction. But, that, but, but the execution can still align with the instruction, especially if the user perceives their execution as correct, even if unrelated to the, under, to the underlying system intent. So we have three heuristics to compute reward and construct a training data from a, from this kind of a, from, from from this kind of interaction data, if the feedback is incorrect or ungrammatical, 
uh, we know we have a bad instruction. So what we're doing is we're creating, we are, we are pairing the system, the, the, the world state and the plan. These are like the model inputs with the generated instruction with the reward of minus one. So this is a bad example, a negative example. If the instruction is correct and grammatical, what we can say is that the execution reflects the instruction meaning. Not necessarily the plan, but the execution reflects the instruction meaning. So we can construct a positive example by using the world state, the execution, as both of those as inputs to the model, and we can do this because the execution is also just a sequence of poses, and with an output as our, as our instruction and with a reward of plus one, so a positive example. Now, if in addition, the plan and the execution are equivalent, then we can say that the instruction actually accurately communicates the plan, and we can construct a positive example using the world state, the plan, both of those as inputs to as model inputs, and as outputs the, the generated instruction with a reward of plus one. Okay, so the kind, this kind of training data that it gives us, it, it gives us these tuples of model input of a state pose sequence, either from the plan or the execution, a generated instructions that we sample during learning and rewards that are either plus one or minus one. And, and this creates a, a very nice contextual bandit scenario. Now bandits are really advantageous for this kind of learning, which where examples are really expensive. Bandits are relatively, when I say relatively compared to something like reinforcement learning, are very data efficient. So how is this a bandit scenario? So our, our, our context are, uh, are the model inputs, what we conditioned on when we create instructions, these are the states and the pose sequences, and the bandit decision is the instruction. Now, even though that our decoder might have a sequential decision process that is generated instruction, as far as the learner is concerned, this is a single action process. There is no sequence. And this is because the reward can only be computed on the complete decision. We can only ask for execution once we have the complete instruction. And anything that we try to do as far as like create assignment there is, 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 is pure guesses, unless we employ more complicated mechanisms. Now the advantage of of this of this of treating this as a contextual bandit scenario is that it reduces the problem or at least brings it very close to a supervised learning problem, and this is really nice because we know how to do supervised learning. We we know how to get optimizers to behave well. We know how to uh, we know that we, we know it works really well. It's relatively data efficient. We want to be in that scenario. It's not really supervised learning for two important differences. One of them is that the data comes from interaction with users. So we, but, but it's very nice because we were able to take data from interaction and actually plug it into this, you know, this, put it in this box where we know we, how to deal with things relatively well in NLP and in general in machine learning at this point. Okay, so our training objective is maximizing the reward. And let me just, just for these two slides, add a bit of notation. So we have a state S, post sequence row, instruction x and a reward of y. And uh, the gradient of this, and, uh, and you can already see how very similar this is to uh, supervised learning, uh, is just the reward multiply with the differentiation of the, of the probability of the, of the observed instruction. OK? So you can see that if we take a positive example with a plus 1, uh, this y just is kind of like disappears, and we get, and we get a, just a supervised gradient, which is fantastic. There is, a, there is a big problem here, though. It's kind of like latent time of surface, is what happens with negative examples. So with negative examples, intuitively, what we try to do with them is we try to uh, kind of like drive the probability of these instructions to zero. But as we push a probability to zero, the log probability will go to minus infinity. And this is going to explode this loss. Negative examples will take over the loss term and, and will derail uh, learning completely. So we don't want that, and we do something relatively simple to, to address this. We borrow a technique that is very common in contextual bandit called inverse propensity scoring. It's usually used for debiasing examples, and we are, and we are using it uh, slightly differently, but, uh, but in a very similar way. 
uh, we are using it to basically uh, get overcome this issue of the of the loss exploding because of the negative example. So what we're doing is we add to the grade, to the objective term this uh, coefficient uh, curly L, and this coefficient is computing using the the label. For positive for positive example, it's just one; it doesn't do anything. For negative examples, it's going to be the inver the IPF uh, coefficient, the inverse propensity score, which is the ratio between the current probability of the of the of the instruction under the current parameters, wherever you are doing learning. Uh, over the uh, over the original probability and for when we sample this instruction. So what's this going to do is like as we drive the probability of the instruction to zero, the importance of that example for the loss is also going to be driven down to zero. So it's going to basically be insignificant as the, as the probability becomes very really small. Okay, so let's put it all together. So Okay, so where were we? We initialize, every, we initialize with supervised data, so we use a very small amount of supervised data for initialization just to get us off the ground running. Uh, and we also use GPT to wait. We get our model, and then we start running this round. We sample from our model instructions, uh, given that whatever state we are in during the interaction, we interact with the user, we collect these data, these tuples, and we, using the heuristics, we construct training data from them. This training data we aggregate to, uh, to a data set that becomes larger and larger over rounds. And then we do offline contextual bandit training, training from scratch every round in order, to in order to get a new generation model. Then we deploy this model and we repeat this process. Okay, so the model that we are, uh, that we are using is an encoder decoder uh, architecture. It's Pretty simple model. Uh, there is a spatial encoding of the environment uh, and the system plans. This gives us a sequence of vectors. And then we have a GPT-2 transformer decoder, which is like a shave. We take the GPT-2 and we shave the bunch of layers just to get it more, more compact. Uh, and uh, we, con we extend it to condition on the encoder output using a technique called pseudo self attention. Okay, so for our experiments, we initialize the model using uh, 360 uh, without of false interactions. We evaluate uh, using task completion and uh, similarity of uh, execution to the system plan using earth mover distance. So this is task completion of the humans trying to accomplish the instruction that we, that we communicated to them and the earth mover distance between their trajectory and, and the, the plan. We generally found a n-gram similarity measures and even like more complex measures like birth score to be largely useless for, for measuring quality uh, in this task. And this means that we don't really have a good automatic stopping criteria. So what we do is, is, is really uh, silly and suboptimal. We just pick um, what we think uh, is, a fix, is a reasonable fixed number of epochs. And, uh, and uh, between each round when we retrain, we just train for this fixed number of epoch and take the model at the end. Okay, we do a number of experiments. All these, each of these experiments is relatively, uh, relatively complex, relatively expensive. It's all done with, with live users. The first one is a long-term study where we run our system for 14 rounds uh, to observe uh, learning trends and interaction trends. And what I'm showing here, task completion rate and earth mover distance, we want task completion rate to go up, earth mover distance to go down. I'm and I'm breaking a performance here. So the blue line, the bold blue line, is overall overall, overall uh, task completion rate and earth mover distance. And I'm also breaking it, breaking it according to categories, depending on how many uh, cards the underlying system plan intended for the system, wanted the user to uh, to collect to select during the execution. So zero cards are instructions like wait, don't do anything, I'm doing something else or something like that, or hold still. While uh, the other ones are depend, you know, one card, two cards, and three cards, and you can see that in general, over rounds, the model continuing continually improves in generating instructions that relate to intent. Uh, multi goal. This is this is across both task completion, and also we get much stronger similarity between uh, the trajectories, the, the trajectory and the and the underlying plan as the as the system progresses. Uh, this is the, and what the, and what we see is, and when we break it into categories, it's really that multi-goal instructions actually take much longer to pick up. So very fast 
we, we actually start pretty good on zero, car, on zero card and even one card and we pick up very fast. With two cards, it takes us a bit longer to pick up, but we get really good performance. And with three cards, it takes us even longer. And then we start picking up at around round eight. Another thing to notice here is this, like uh, after about round eight, we have a small drop in performance on one card instructions. And I'm going to go back to that uh, a bit later. Okay, we also see that the system just performs better. The, user, the user's perceived uh, correctness increases over time. Uh, again, we can break it according to categories and you can see a similar trends with two cards and three cards. It takes longer until it happens. Uh, the game score also increases over time. So the game score starts from 4.5, so uh, at the beginning, and goes all the way to 2.4 uh, at the end. So really drastic improvements. We also I analyzed the language, and this is and this is a thing where things were we saw some kind of like some surprising results that how language changes over the uh, over the system's lifetime. In general, language becomes simpler, uh, and this is potentially happens because the language is more attuned to the task. Uh, so we see the vocabulary size uh, decreases over time. Uh, that's the blue line, and the mean instruction length also decreases over time. Um, and this and, and a lot of this is because the system drops words it really doesn't know how to use well or you know it, it often had tends to at the beginning it has this like suffixes that don't make any sense at the end it drops those as well so this is good but it's also a uh, slightly overcompensating and it's uh, and it has a harder time describing more descriptive paths later on and this is why this is the reason why we saw this drop the sudden drop uh, at, uh, in the performance for one card uh, instructions at, at the beginning, at, uh, at around uh, the middle of its lifetime, around round eight. As far as syntax, things are a bit more complex. We see when we look at dependency structures, we see that the max depth decreases, so simplification, but the branching factor significantly increases while the max width kind of like stays the same. So what kind of data that we are getting during the lifetime? So this is also uh, something that evolves over time. So we can look at like how many negative and positive examples we are getting. So in general, as the, as, as the uh, later on during the lifetime interaction, we get more data per round because the interactions are longer. The system is much more, is much better performance. They get, we, when, if they get more points, they get more turns, they can interact for longer, for longer with the user. So in general, we see more instruction. And but but even but even uh, more interesting is like we in general the number of negative instructions per round decreases throughout the system's lifetime. But the num well the well the number the overall number increases and the number of positive inc of positive instructions uh, increases. And when we when we break this trend according to the uh, categories of zero card, one card, two card, and three card, you can really see. What uh, the, how this distribution uh, of examples uh, uh, explains the kind of like the bootstrapping process that we saw. So zero card we start very good and uh, uh, negative examples almost disappear. For one card negative dominate in the beginning but very quickly we positive examples overtake them. With two cards we start really bad. Almost no example is right at the beginning but we very quickly learn and at the end the positive examples really dominate. With three cards, which are much more rare in our system because, of, because they require kind of like having cards that are located one next to another, then in the beginning, for quite a while, we don't see any, any, positive, any positive examples. That's why learning takes such a long time to pick up. But as, once we pick up, we, 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 we barely see any, any negative examples after a while and only positive ones. Okay, uh, the next study we did is we compared our system to different variants uh, of learning. So the, uh, I think I'll go through that really, for many slides really fast. So I'll be happy to go back to them if there are questions. The, we compare our full setup. Uh, POS only, only uses positive examples, so no negative examples. TC only, only uses, ignores the feedback questions completely. And fine tuning uses fine tuning instead of free training, which was a bit harder to uh, to get it to work because it requires additional decisions about uh, hyperparameters and learning algorithms. In general, we see that the system is pretty robust to the different decisions. We see that a positive example, using only positive examples slow down learning. 
The feedback questions are not necessary for learning, but they do give a system that has higher perceived correctness rate. Fine tuning uh, is actually potentially better at keeping a more diverse vocabulary, although we do think that this result requires a further study. And uh, without negative examples, the vocabulary and the, and, its, and, exam, and the instruction lens decay much, much faster. So negative examples are pretty important there. Uh, we also had another experiment we compared to supervised learning. Surprisingly, despite the fact that we don't require any written instructions, for supervised learning, I, overall, our data performed uh, much better compared to similar amount of supervised learning. I will skip the error analysis, and I will just thank the students who did the work. So Serial Bar is the work of Elaine Sor, together with the, with the game designed by Claudia Yan. The generation work that I described is the work of, uh, of Nori in collaboration with Elaine. Uh, I think I'm over time, but I'm very happy to stay as much as uh, possible to answer uh, any questions. Thank you.